This show is brought to you by the Garden Gurus and Evergreen Garden Care. Evergreen Garden Care and their market leading brands are some of the most tr trusted consumers. brands within the garden care market. Garden Express are Australia's leading mail order gardening service offering a wide range of quality garden products. Each week on the Garden Gurus Live, the team at Garden Express will share a weekly offer. So make sure after today's show, you jump online and visit their website. Thank you. Good morning and welcome to the Garden Gurus Live. I'm Trevor Cochran. It's great to have you joining us on this beautiful Monday morning. Uh, for most of the country at the moment, um, we're in cool, wet conditions, particularly up and down the East Coast. There's a lot of people who are dealing with problems that we haven't had to deal with for some period of time, things like uh, huge amounts of water, and uh, that can create all sorts of problems. So I expect that we are going to have a few questions that are probably more fungal related today. The whole idea of today, of course, is that you get to ask your questions. And a bit later on, I've got a special guest joining us. It's uh, Dr. Daryl Hardy, or Dr. Bugalugs as he's best known. Um, Daryl is the Acting Deputy Chief of Plant Biosecurity uh, over here in the West. And he has a little bit of advice for a thrip that is causing tremendous amounts of problems in home gardens. So we'll talk to Daryl about that a bit later on. Uh, with summer obviously hitting here on the West in a big way, um, we really had hot, dry conditions over the weekend. And today, it's humid. In fact, the the city of Perth was really surrounded in a in a, a haze that was just uh, just mist, basically, just humidity, just sitting at its best. So it's very very tropical here in uh, in Perth this Monday morning. Um, so we are dealing with some really quite unusual conditions. Um, a bit later on, I'll talk about how to keep your lawn looking good. In fact, not just your lawn, but your whole garden, because right now there's something you need to do that's going to make the world a difference to the way moisture is available to your plants. I've got a great Garden Express offer for you coming up. It'll be a little bit later on today. I don't think we're gonna get the guys. I think they're um, they're all busy over there madly packing to get all that stuff off before Christmas lockdown. And uh, of course, we'll have some prizes to give away. And I'll talk to you about my favorite plant at the moment at home. This is my plant of the week. Do you know that one? You'll know the fruit that of course is beautiful cherries. And I'll tell you a little bit about how to grow cherries in a warmer climate. Uh, for those of you in cooler climates, it's not so hard, but uh, in the warmer climates, it's very difficult to get fruit. And I'll explain how I make it work for me over here in Western Australia. Now, it's not all about WA. In fact, it's all about everybody's garden all across the country. The most important thing you need to do is let us know where you are from. If you can tell us the state and town or suburb, it makes a big difference to the way I can answer certain questions. Now, first up, we are going to jump into a question that's come in from Linda. Linda sent a fantastic photo, and this is a good idea. If you are not sure yourself or you're finding it difficult to describe what the problem is with your plant, um, then let's have a look at this. You can see it's a gardenia, and it's yellow. In fact, you can see there's this yellow streaking occurring across the leaves um, running up and down the veins. Two problems with gardenias this time of the year, and Linda's sort of brought up that she's seen this yellowing, uh, and she is also not seeing the same flower um, bud set that she would normally expect. This plant is hungry. It is hungry for a well-balanced diet, and in particular, it needs two very important, um, two very very important uh, elements. One is it's clearly lacking in a bit of a bit of iron but it's also lacking in mag uh, magnesium. And um, I'm looking at that photo going, yep, all right. So Epsom salts, sulfate of iron, it's gonna acidify the soil. Usually what happens with these things is that you'll find the, the plants like gardenias, um, camellias, rhododendrons, everything that sits in that sort of group of plants, that family of plants, they really do suffer um, when there is a lack of, of, of 
good nutrients available, but some nutrients are locked up when your soil becomes too alkaline. And I suspect, Linda, that you might find your soils a little on the alkaline side, that you're lacking those minerals. But in future, the important thing here is going to be use a really well-balanced diet. When you're feeding your plants, you've got to make sure that you've got as many of those micro and macronutrients in that, in that fertiliser as possible. And with gardenias, a controlled release is always a good way to go. But right at the moment, sulphate of iron and some Epsom salts watered over the foliage will make a big difference. Hopefully that helps you, Linda. Now, uh, Taffer is in Sydney. Hello, Taffer. But small white flies eating my basil. What should I do to keep them away? Oh, I suspect you've got white fly, which is a pretty common pest this time of the year. Um, not unusual to see it attack basil. Um, and the easiest way to control it when it comes to um, basil, um, probably some of the crucifers as well. So, you know, your broccoli, your cabbage, no sorts of plants is to give it a really good soaking. And I mean a soaking under the foliage and above the foliage with a um, horticultural oil. So eco oil, white oil, um, any of those really does make a big difference to the to the way you control the pests. Um, this particular pest can move between plants and uh, it can do a fair bit of damage when it gets into plague proportion. And this time of the year, you can see it suddenly build up into really big quantities. So apply that now and you should be fine. Um, Sane, I think it is. Uh, Kanamala in Queensland. Hello, everybody in Queensland. My friend's property is overflowing with ants. There is a giant ant nest with billions of ants on everything. The ground is black with small ants. I've tried getting it professionally sprayed and it only helped for a few days. Any tips? Yeah, look, there, there's a few ant controls. The granular forms for these, these types of ant plagues, um, they're very, look, I'm going to tell you now, they're, they're quite a toxic chemical, but they're very effective in controlling um, significant problems. So I would suggest you want to look at one of those granular ant killers, and it needs to be applied direct to where the ants' nests are. And that will bring your, you know, your quantities down. If this was a small outbreak of ants, I would suggest something like talcum powder. They hate it, uh, particularly the big ants. They really do drive them crazy and they will get up and they'll actually move their nests somewhere else. But um, in Queensland at the moment, there's been a fair bit of rain and it continues to flow this week. So I don't think that's going to help. Um, Joe is in West Pingley in WA. Hello, my roses were smashed by the hail last weekend. Do I need to prune them back? Uh, the answer is, Joe, probably yes. You'll probably find the foliage is torn and damaged and uh, giving them a, a prune probably around about 30 to 45 centimetres back get them back into shape, give them a feed, you'll get a great burst of growth and you'll get a good flush of flowers. Um, looking at the timing, probably not going to get them. You might get them just after Christmas if you if you prune them now. Tanya is in Geelong. So we go to Victoria. We've got another photo now. This is a really good one. Uh, let's chuck that one up on the screen. You can see it there. Uh, Tanya, you have got the yellowest lemon tree I have ever seen. Now, You've been feeding it with Osmocote, the boost and feed, but it still shows sign of stress. Now, this is a classic case of, a, well, I would suggest you've got a pH problem because that level of yellow is very, very unusual. You are missing iron. You are missing magnesium. You are missing all the greening elements in this, and this plant needs a really good fertilizer. But right now, the, the first thing I would be doing is I would be liquid feeding over the foliage and I would be looking at adding that sulfate of iron we just talked about before, um, probably some sulfate of potash. You're going to acidify the soil. That should balance out your pH. And um, and then just a good all-round fertiliser. Citrus are what we call gross feeders. They do eat or will require a lot of nutrient, particularly this time of the year. But that is one of the yellowest trees I think I've seen. So, uh, yeah, I would get into it pretty quickly if I was you. Now, I alluded to a special guest today, and um, I think that um, we might go uh, jump across to him if we can. Um, Dr. Daryl Hardy is uh, the Acting Deputy Chief of uh, Plant Biosecurity. Um, I think that is at um, the Agriculture Department. Good morning to you. How are you going, Daryl? Yeah, good. Thanks, Trevor. Thanks for the invite. Hey, thanks for joining us. Um, Better known as Dr. Bugalugs because uh, very few people know bugs as well as you do. 
Yeah, um, yeah, and it's mutates into other things now. It's uh, Doctor Loverbugs. It's uh, it keeps on. It's got a life of its own, thanks to the ABC. <laughs> well, mate, look, I, I'm particularly interested at the moment in a problem that's occurring uh, commonly across the Perth metro area, and um, this this is not an unusual thing. I think on in in Victoria there is a very similar problem occurring with the Western Flower Thrip. And, and over here, we have suddenly seen chili thrips arrive. Um, now, they were in the north of WA, but, but is this climate change that's seen uh, more effect on them coming south? Um, yeah, look, you've really hit the, the, the hard spot there, haven't you, straight up, Trevor? Yeah. But uh, look, you're right. We found them first um, in Kananara region back in the early 2000s. And... Um, they did nothing and we hadn't heard from them until um, probably two years ago. And then um, people like yourself, the media um, horticulturalists and that um, around mm. WA started ringing in and telling me, oh, we've got this virus from the, that virus that's killing all the roses in the US. So we went and investigated. We go, no, it's just some thrips. And they, so they said, oh, but it's so, it's so, you know, it's so devastating. You need to look at it. And we thought it'd be Western flower thrips to start with because they, as you said, they do a similar sort of job and a similar sort of problem. And, and then we discovered it was um, um, the chili thrips, uh, Skirto thrips dorsalis. So mm -hmm. it's been dormant for 20 years, maybe. We're not sure. So there's several scenarios. One, it uh, has migrated down from the north with possible climate change or just normal um, migration move, movement by people or that. And yep. um, But it also is um, the last two to three summers in Western Australia have been in the south have been very strange. We've had more subtropical weather, so they may have been here for the last twenty years as well. And then and suddenly the, the conditions are perfect. Yeah, and they've just fired up. Yeah, exactly. So we've discounted that it's this this nasty virus and it's um, and the chili thrips and probably there's a little bit of plate thrips in there and a little bit of Western flower thrips as well. So um, it's the poster boy at the moment. Okay, well, you know, the damage, could you describe what the damage looks like? They tend to attack the new foliage as it's, as it's coming out, don't they? They like the softer foliage. Yeah, well, th this, this is the big issue because people respond when they see the damage and it's almost too late then. So the, the actual thrips will get in the enclosed buds, the enclosed flowers, and, and they'll actually be, the larvae will be rasping away. So they're a rasper, and so they rasp the surface of the epidermis and then the... the, 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 the the contents of the cells will come out, you know, the chlor chlorophyll and all that, and they feed on that. So that yep. causes scarring. And as the tissue grows, because it's a very tight bud, that tissue expands and it's scar tissue. It's like a scab. So yep. you could basically say that's it. And, um, and then people start spraying once the bud emerges or the flower emerges. And it's too late then. You've actually got to have a preemptive uh, strategy with this one. Okay. So this, this is a... Um... An interesting little bug and you, you uh, alluded to the fact that it's a rasping effect just so people understand what we're talking about here is mites tend to drill a little hole into the cell and, and suck the, the the goodness out these guys they scratch the outside which just causes it to the sap to basically seep out um yeah. they'll they'll con they'll consume that and then the the actual uh tissue scars over so that's when you see the brown or the twisted contorted foliage, right? So I've noticed that was a pretty bad problem last year. Yeah, so the, tish, the twisted uh, foliage works in the thrips uh, advantage. Um, a lot of people maybe find on citrus or ficus, those large black thrips, um, and they actually, yes. they protect themselves by the leaf curling up and they actually form a little colony. So if you roll out the leaf, it'll just be swarming with them. Um, with thrips, so with thrips. it's yeah. So the curling up actually provides a safe refuge for the thrips, and also from predators, but also from your chemical treatments. And that's why you really need to drown the plant um, and drown it early. And if you're using a botanical, um, you need to do it frequently. If you're using a yep. more conventional insecticide less frequently. Um, we've actually put on the website um, at um, Deepherd. So if you just did chili thrips um, Deepherd in your Google yep. search, and it'll come up and there's a list of botanicals that we've uh, worked through with the APVMA that people can use. Mm -hmm. um, um, the, um, the more conventional insecticides are a bit problematic at the moment. Um, whether they're registered or not, we're still working through that with the APVMA. Okay. But if it's, Look, it's, it's and on that particular gonna... plant, then you can use it. 
I was going to say, yeah, it's it's an interesting um, challenge. And one of the things I, I remember back in my days working in the, the garden industry as a nurseryman, one of the big challenges for us back then treating thrips uh, was their ability to develop resistance to chemicals as well. So, you know, in, incredibly frequent spraying can actually build up a, a, a tolerance to that particular chemical. And next thing you know, it's having no effect at all and you're applying three times as much, doing a lot more damage to the broader environment. So it's it's very much about one good spray, not that population. And and what's the life cycle? Is the breeding cycle about 14 days? It used to be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It depends on it. All insects are temperature driven, but yeah, this time yep. of the year, once, I mean, and this one's more of a tropical species from Asia. So um, uh, well, I think it's from Asia. It may have come from the Americas to Asia and then through Australia. Um, but mm -hmm. yeah, um, it likes you know, the temperatures above 25, but certainly that 30 degree mark is you know, really good. So anything 25 to 35 and the population will explode for sure. Yeah. Well, it's certainly um, over here in the West and, and look, even on the East Coast at the moment, um, uh, high humidity, um, we're, we're seeing temperatures sort of in the mid 20s to high 20s uh, up and down the eastern seaboard. So everybody's going to be sort of experiencing some kind of thrip uh, explosion about now. And it's, yep. it's usually the flowers where it's most noticeable. So if you're finding that you're picking roses and within a day, all the petals have dropped off the rose that you've picked, it's highly likely that, that it's actually been these thrips that are active. Usually the Western flower thrips is the one that causes all the petals to drop off. But there's a huge range of thrips, isn't there? And you do have to be very careful with how you treat them. Yeah, exactly. And and Western flower thrips, uh, that came preloaded with resistance because it's out of the Americas and they're very, um, thankfully, or not, unfortunately, loaded up with chemical resistance because they've it's a native there and they've been dealing with it for um 40 or 50 years. So it mm -hmm. was a real challenge when it arrived in the early 90s. Um, the plague thrips still, they can be controlled quite easily. They usually move into areas, especially around the Perth area, as we're drying off now. They're on the grasses and that. And mm -hmm. I did some work mm -hmm. you know, 20, 30 years ago on snow peas. They'd move into, um, as soon as the grass is dried off in the paddocks, they'd just move into these um, uh, snow, snow peas. Uh, yeah, and just murder them. And you see those white blotches. Um, I noticed you earlier on, you're talking about eco oils and the white oils and that, and mm -hmm. they work really well. I've got a new poster boy when it comes to botanicals, and it's not a new one. It goes back to the 1920s, but it's the yep. insecticidal soaps. Um, yes. I find them very good, and no insect's going to develop resistance to them. Uh, so they're really good. So they're not like your normal soap. Um, normal soaps, you, know, you can buy the, uh, you can make it up yourself and, and you smother the insects. Well, this one you smother as well. But the interesting thing with the insecticidal soaps, they're potassium salts of fatty acids. So they're a different type of soap. Um, yep. And the thing about them is they also desiccate. So they dry them out to a little crisp. So they have a dual action. They either smother them or dry them out. And any tiny, um, slow moving, sucking insect, um, they're really, good target and plus being a soap they they break down the surfactant and you don't have the problems with burning that you get with oil the one yep. downside you can have is that if you spray a potted plant on a brick paving or something like that or against a wall you'll get that yep. soapy sheen that will take a couple of days to wash off so just be careful at where you're spraying it that's good soap. advice Daryl. that's that's great advice insecticidal soaps they used to be the the absolute go-to for a long period of time and sort of sort of lost their their popularity but it sounds to me like they're going to be on their way back in a big big way if that's uh, one of the best ways to treat this pest yeah and a lot of growers are picking up on it now and the other thing with oils uh, if you do repeated oil dosages you have the burning issue but the other issue you have is you block the plant up the stomata actually get clogged up you can you can actually overload the plant with oil so it becomes yeah you know, you're going forward with the soaps they will wash off. So any rain event or, or irrigation event, you'll, you'll, you'll lose the effectiveness of the soap straight away. Mate, we've got questions flying through from all over the country at the moment. Um, there's not a huge number. I think we've, we've done very well on answering the question about thrips this week, but I would love to uh, love to touch base with you again sometime in the near future and talk about some of the other pests that are quite active out there. This one, uh, I'm talking about my plant of the week a bit later on, and uh, I don't have any problems with fruit fly at the moment, but fruit fly is one that within about three weeks' time, I'll guarantee you every second question we get on the show 
is all about fruit fly. So maybe we could touch base with you and talk to you about uh, the, the med and also the Queensland fruit fly and what people have got to look out for. Yeah, certainly not a problem. I mean, Medfly, I'm a full bottle. I'm good at eradicating QFly. I haven't had a lot no. of experience, but that, yeah, there are similarities and there are a few differences between dealing with the uh, the two species, the Australian native QFly and, of course, the exotic Mediterranean fruit fly. So, yeah, look, I'm I'm a public servant, Trevor, and I'm here at your beckoning call. <laughs> Just don't ask me any political questions. Thanks, Daryl. Okay. <laughs> I won't. We won't talk about climate change again, mate. Thanks so much for joining us this morning. It's uh, it's really good to have you on the show. Yeah, and good to chat with you again. Thanks, Trevor. See you. Take care, mate. Bye. Um, very very interesting man. Knows a lot of what's happening right at this moment in time in gardens. And look, most of these problems are quite common right across Australia. So that's why I thought it was really relevant to catch up with Daryl. Now let's roll into some questions because we do have a lot rolling through at the moment. Uh, Judy is in central Queensland. What's the best fertiliser for Xoras? So Xora is a beautiful tropical plant and they are another one that can get a little bit on the yellow side coming out of winter if the soil is alkaline and if there's not enough magnesium and iron in the soil. So fertiliser, it's got to be an all-round fertiliser. It's got to have a good balance of nutrients and this would be my preference. This would be what I would suggest you look out for. It's Osmocote and you're not going to see the ingredients super well there, but you see the complexity of the number of different mineral nutrients that sit in this. That is vitally important in providing what your what your plants need. And, and to give you an idea, I just, just talked about uh, iron and and, uh, and the other one is sulfur, which is also very important too. But magnesium, 0.3%, iron, 0.4%, um, sulfur, 6.1%. It's going to acidify the soil a little bit, but uh, terrific way to, um, to get your plants growing strongly. And because it's controlled, controlled release and slow release, it really does the world of good. So that's my suggestion, Osmocote plus Organics. Judy in central Queensland, I hope you're happy with that. Tyson, g'day mate. Uh, Tyson's from Barony in Victoria, good friend of ours. How, do I have any tips on planting cauliflower seeds? Uh, at this time of the year, uh, you really want to get them in right now because you don't want to be another two months down the line as they're coming through. They will go to flower a bit too quickly. They, There are a couple of good all-year-round all, round, all year round, uh, varieties, but this is a better plant to grow in cooler conditions, Tyson. Um, if you're going to plant the seed, uh, the, the old story is that uh, you plant the seed three times the depth of the seed. So you don't have to dig. You know, it's only, We're only talking you know, a few millimetres here. Um, to get that, those seeds into the soil. But um, literally making sure that the soil remains moist is a critical factor. So making sure you're adding organics in before you plant your seeds, wet it right down, plant your seeds in, wet it again, and those seeds will germinate and germinate quite quickly. So hopefully that helps, Tyson. It's not a hard plant to grow the cauliflower, um, particularly by seed. Carolyn is asking a question. She's in Melbourne. Is it too late to prune camellias? No, it's not too late. Camellias will respond to pruning. You don't want to hit them too hard this time of the year because there is a risk if you open them up a bit too much uh, and you get a really hot day, you could get bad burn on the inside. So I hope that um, I hope that, that helps. Lynn is in Les Moody. That's actually my territory. Um, really interesting part of the world because we have a lot of well, summer fruit starting to come through now. So it's the uh, deciduous fruit, plums, nectarines, peaches, uh, and particularly apricots. They're the next one I'll talk to you about in uh, in a week's time because mine are, my trees are full of fruit. Lynn's, however, is a satsuma plum. And she's finding the foliage is being eaten by a little green cricket type bug. The leaves are looking uh, book leafing. How do I control this book leafing? I'm assuming that means that they're stuck, stuck together. Um, this is actually one of those situations that Daryl's just talked about. The pest that you're talking about that's doing the damage right now um, has pretty much done the damage and it's not going to do any more damage. The only thing that you really can do is either give them a light prune. You don't want to prune off any, any fruit, of course, but you can prune the tree this time of the year. I'm, I'm about to undertake a uh, probably about a third of the foliage on my plums are being removed because the trees themselves are, um, are getting very, very tall, but the fruit is actually set down lower. And I want the fruit to stay low 
Uh, so that's why I'm going to do that. So you could give it a light prune. The trick, however, is to give it a feed now. And uh, Lynn, that'll encourage us some new fresh growth. And you shouldn't see those bugs anymore because they will have moved on. Jenny is in southeast Melbourne. I would like to source a lemon bottle brush. I visited Bunnings and local nurseries with no luck. Any idea where I could get one? Jenny, I don't off the top of my head. Look, what I would suggest you do, duck into um, or even just go online to um, Garden World. They're, they're in Melbourne. They're a great garden centre. It's one of the great things about independent garden centres is that they will source out uh, those rare and unusual plants that, uh, that you struggle to get your hands on. So I would suggest that you do that, Garden World. And I think that... Uh, that you're probably going to find that right now is a good time to be asking for them because I think that um, pretty much the majority of bottle brush that are going to be available this season will be available right now. Um, in about a month's time, uh, the whole cycle's gone. The, the, uh, the, the bottle brushes will be pretty much sold out if they're not in a retailer. Okay, let's have a quick talk about um, getting some great results out of your garden. So we know that we've had a fair bit of rainfall on the east coast. We know that we've had uh, no rainfall in the last week or so on the west coast. We did get a bit of rain the week before and, and it's been a very small amount now. So this is when you want water to drain and uh, you want the water to drain into the roots and into the top profile of the soil. And if you're really in a, in a in a difficult situation, um, and when I mean difficult situation, I mean from a wet, wettable soil point of view, you don't want water sitting on the surface, you want it to go right through. Now, many, many years ago, uh, the very first wetting agents that were used in gardens were developed over here in the West, but they weren't originally developed for the purpose of uh, soil wettability. What, what they were developed for was to make sure that in heavy soils out in Kalgoorlie and surrounds, um, that water didn't pull because the big trucks that were working on the mine sites could end up getting bogged. So they started to develop these, what we call wetting agents now, to ensure that water drained through that topsoil so that it stayed as dry as possible. So water was getting down deep. And in, in home garden environments, we developed this, what we call a waxy coating over the organic material that's in the soil. And when that spreads through, that can stop water penetrating evenly through the soil in a home garden environment. Those where I suppose the the beginning of uh, of where wetting agents started and and the purpose of wetting agents today is to make sure that water is getting down evenly into the soil, gives the plants a chance to take it up, um, so that if you've got dry pockets, which in some places we're going to see that, or if you've just got excessive amounts of water at the moment. Other places you would just want to make sure it is getting down and deep into the soil. You need to apply a wetting agent. Now, uh, when we talk about this, there are there are wetting agents and there are fertilisers. And if you can apply a wetting agent with a fertiliser or ideally a fertiliser with a wetting agent in it, particularly on lawns, you're going to get this very, very lush, dark green growth, strong, healthy lawn and no dry patches and pockets. This is where Scott's developed Lawn Builder with a wetting agent in it. And this is probably the product you should be using right now. It's really important that you are one, feeding your lawn and two, making sure that we're getting wetting agents um, to get the water evenly in amongst the lawn's roots. So whether it be whether it be a wetting agent being used in a home environment, so in the garden, or whether it be on the lawn, now you need to apply a wetting agent. With lawns, now you need to apply a fertilizer and now you can get Scott's Lawn Builder plus wedding agent. So you can do two in one for your lawns. It's a great way to keep your lawn looking good. And now's the time to do it because if you apply it literally this week, come Christmas time when you've got your friends and family coming over, they're going to look at your lawn and they're going to go, wow, it's lush, dark green and looks really healthy because you've done the right thing right at the moment. Very, very good way to go. And um, yeah, I think I've probably hit all the points that you need to know about that. Um, I'll keep answering some questions for you because they're steadily flowing through. Make sure you tell us uh, where you're from. So we do want to know the state and, and your town or suburb. And uh, very important um, that if you like what we're doing, if you like this show, that you hit the like button. It helps share and spread the word. So um, please do that. Leanne is in Doreen in Victoria. When is a good time to prune Selvias? Um, probably not right now. Leanne, because uh, unless they're really leggy, 
um, you're going to be getting lots of flour. So I really think that you probably want to let it just flour and enjoy that. If they've finished flour and that's the time to prune them, then uh, go and give them a prune back. But but probably not too hard, more to shape if you're going to do anything just at the moment because they should burst back and produce more flowers. Margaret is in Belgrave in Victoria. We're staying in Victoria. I always thought when planting new trees or plants, you have to tease the roots. But I've noticed on TV that you don't. Is this something we should be doing? Well, if you damage the roots in any way, there's always a risk that you're going to set the plant back. Now, if you're buying plants that are not overly advanced in the pot, um, that don't have too much of a wraparound with their root system, you're going to be in a situation where um, you can just put the plant straight into the ground and those roots will continue to grow down and out, which is what you want. Um, when you've got quite a root bound plant, it is a good idea to tease those roots because you don't, what happens is, is they, they grow, plants roots grow out like this. When they're in a pot, they grow out, they hit the side of the pot and they grow down like that. You end up with this matting around the outside. Now, when you've just got a ball of roots on the outside, that's when, Margaret, you, you have to start teasing those roots out because when you put it in the ground, those roots have been trained to continue growing around and they'll sort of stay within that structure. You won't get the spread through the soil. So that's time to tease them. It gets down to the plant. So take a look at the plants you're buying. Ideally, you should never be buying plants that have got massively sort of root systems because there is a fair amount of risk that when you're teasing those roots out that the plant might shock and die as well so um yeah hopefully that helps sandy we're not sure where you're from please let us know folks where you're from sandy can you plant grevillea says can you plant grevillea tube stock straight into the ground absolutely sandy if you've got irrigation if the soil is moist you can do it now typically in the west because we have a wet winter and then we go dry during the summer for several months um, I wouldn't do it in the West this time of the year. So if you're in a, if you have a dry summer environment, then you do not want to go putting grevilleas um, in tube stock into the ground. I would be doing it personally. I think the best time of the year to do it is May. And then with the winter rains, you tend to find that uh, they, they establish themselves pretty quickly. So hopefully that helps, Sandy. I think I might move quickly on to my plant of the week. Um, this is a cherry. And uh, I took a branch and I took some fruit and I wanted to show you one of my favorite plants in my garden at the moment. So you can see there's just clusters of them. There's a few here that they're, they're not quite 100% ripe yet, um, which that makes them just a little on the sour side. You can see them there. Now, the type of cherries, I've got two in my garden. I think the, the two most reliable when it comes to uh, producing great table fruit uh, for me, it's a variety called Bing, and the other one is a variety called Stella. Now, you should ideally have both of them um, because you want to get the cross-pollination of the flower. It's very important with cherries. Um, and right now, you'll be harvesting fruit. It's been a fabulous year in Western Australia because it's been cooler in around the Perth metro area. So my trees, literally the branches are sort of hanging down because the fruit's starting to get to a decent size and uh, that's just great news all around. This does mean that, of course, I've got to um, got to put some netting over them to keep the birds off. But I kind of work on the theory that the birds can have the ones at the top. And I've got to be on, on my game to make sure I'm harvesting uh, as much as, as regularly as, as I possibly can. Because literally every single day now, we will be harvesting kilos of fruit and that'll probably run right through until maybe the third week or so second week at least anyway of december so another two to three weeks um, of good harvesting so cherries if you haven't grown them before uh, they are a fabulous tree they can get on the larger side there are some dwarf varieties um, i should mention this uh, the guys at flemings do an amazing job with their selection and also they do some uh, grafting onto dwarfing rootstocks. Uh, it's quite an intricate process, but that means that you end up with a small tree, only gets to a metre and a half, maybe two metres, and there's a handful of very popular varieties that perform pretty much all over the country. If you are living, I'm going to say north of Perth, if you are living in the high area of, of, of uh, Sydney, you will be able to, uh, sorry, you won't be able to. We What we... Um, 
I suppose what we need to be conscious of is that this is a cool climate tree. So it does need some colder hours. If you are tropical, if you're humid, then you are going to find that um, that you're going to struggle to get fruit. Uh, yeah. Have you got questions on cherries? Have you thought of growing them at home yourself? They're a beautiful flowering tree in their own right, but producing fresh fruit, uh, which is incredibly expensive at the moment, um, I think you should be growing your own. Trees are not that expensive. What do you think? All right. I'm going to keep going to questions because they are flowing through at the moment at a rate of knots. We've got Mark in Singleton in WA. He's coming via the YouTube uh, channel, so via the broadcast. There. He lives near the beach. Singleton um, is an interesting place, has quite alkaline uh, coastal soils, very sandy soils. He's looking to install some turf. Very sandy, very weedy soil. What's the best mix for a soil underlay? Well, actually, talk to your um, talk to your uh, turf supplier, um, Mark. There's there's some really good what what they literally call underlay. So it's a bit like your carpet. Um, this is an usually an organic mixture. Um, Bailey's produce a fabulous product in Western Australia. They're a local Western Australian company, um, and it's called uh, I'm pretty sure it's called Lawn Reviver. So if you've got a you know, patchy lawn, you can put it over the top. If you've got a um, if you've got a lawn that uh, just is about to be laid, then you can put this over the soil and scratch it into the surface of the soil. You want a depth of about that much, a little or 80 to 100 mils or so in depth. Dig that in, then put your lawn down on top, then get a plate compactor and push that that uh, those roots into the topsoil and water. You will need to water at least once a day, probably twice a day, when you've got the heat that we are seeing currently in and around um, the Perth metro area. It is very warm over here in the west. Uh, hopefully that helps. Uh, let's go to Victoria where it's been cool and wet and Kay is in southwest Victoria. Do I have any tips for planting a wisteria in heavy clay? Yeah, I do. So wisteria do not like their, their roots being too uh, compacted and too, too wet. So clay can be quite problematic. What I would suggest you do, Kay, is get a, a piece of pipe, a hollow pipe and a hammer and knock it into the ground in and around the outside of the area where you're going to plant the wisteria. Now, the reason for that is that I want to I want to make sure that you're going to put some um, gypsum into that soil and what you'll literally do is put the gypsum down the holes and wet it up. So make sure it's nice and wet. Then I would plant in the middle of those holes a beautiful planting hole for your wisteria to go in, fill it up with organic matter, get it so that it's mounded, and then plant your wisteria into the top of that. That will get your wisteria off to the best possible start. And don't forget, whenever you're planting anything in your garden, natives or exotics like wisteria, um, put one of those little tree planting tablets in. You can get them from your local garden center. They are absolutely fabulous. They provide nutrient down deep at the bottom of the hole, the roots grow down towards it. And once your roots are on the way down, they follow the moisture down as well. And you tend to find you've got a deeper root system. Very important in heavy clays. But punching those holes in around the outside, K, it's important for a very special reason. That is, that it is going to aerate the soil. The gypsum that's getting in there is going to make sure that it crumbles up and that it, it, it's it's a little bit more open and capable of absorbing moisture, but, but also not uh, being too compacted as well. Julia, we're not sure where you're from. What's the best fertilizer for citrus? Well, the best fertilizer for citrus is a specialized citrus fertilizer. And I think I've actually got one right here that I would recommend. So this is one called Performance Naturals. It's citrus and fruit. Uh, specifically, it has got uh, high levels of iron. Uh, it's got a reasonable level of nitrogen, but it's got lots of calcium. Uh, it's pretty good source of, uh, of sulfur. Potassium, which is what stimulates good fruiting, very good level of that. Most importantly, it has iron and it also has magnesium, something that citrus really want. Now, you'll find this in your local bunning store. It's called Performance Naturals Citrus and Fruit. Fabulous, fabulous product. Good question. Very important that you use a specialised fruit fertiliser when you're growing those sorts of plants. Okay, uh, Brooke wants to know, is it okay to use out-of-date packet seeds. Now seeds have viability, it means that they're good for a certain period of time and then after that the viability starts to drop off. Um, I would suggest to you that give it a go, plant them, 
you may not get the same germination rate. You may not get a germination germination rate at all, depending on the type of seed. Because, you know, there is seed that's been popped into, there was maize seed that was popped into the pyramids, for example, 4,000 years ago, and uh, they've pulled them out, planted them, and they've grown. So it really does depend on the type of seed. But I would give them a go. You can't lose anything, can you? James is in Mahogany Creek. Now, this is up in the Perth Hills. It's um, usually sort of heavier soils, it tends to get very dry this time of the year. James says he knows it's past rose pruning time, but I'm looking for advice. I've noticed some gardeners prune severely while some prune lighter. I've done both over the years and I've never noticed a difference. What do you recommend? I recommend during winter, uh, and usually it's the first week in Perth, it's the first week of August, uh, you get in, you prune back your roses really hard. That's what you do. As soon as your roses are growing and producing flowers, regular pruning, and that's probably taking about 30 to 45 centimetres um, of growth off the plant and pruning to an outward facing bud will always deliver you more flowers and stronger, healthier growth. Hopefully that helps, James. Now, I think uh, we might want to move on to Garden Express because we have got the most amazing offer for you coming up. Now, I think we've got a clip. Shall we run into that? Here it is. When I first started in horticulture, I was fascinated with orchids, but it wasn't until I started growing some vidiums that I was hooked. They can appear to be tricky, but they are actually a lot easier to grow than what you might think. Subvidiums tend to prefer to grow in a spot that is protected from hot sun, frost and even strong winds. Their ideal environment would be a nice warm spot with nice airflow. But if you live in a cooler climate like myself, you can still grow them. You can pop them into a glass house or have them in a protected patio or under the shelter of a taller tree. Most gums, even wattle trees, make great canopy shelters for these exotic plants. Heavier canopy trees will do the trick in summer when the sun is too hot. But in the winter, they may cast too much shade. So don't forget to check in on your plants. Even though these plants are tough, don't forget to water them throughout the year. If they are left too dry for a long period of time, they may not flower too well the following year. The beauty of these plants are their wonderful flowers and they come in all sorts of colours. So you can find your perfect colour match on the Garden Express website where you can pick up one of these plants for just $25, which is a saving of 25%. So jump online and you can start your collection today. There you go. What a great deal. Cymbidium orchids are a fabulous plant to grow. Now's the time to be putting them into pots. So this is a great deal to get your hands on. Two plants for just $25. So originally $33.80, saving a 20%. The guys at Garden Express never let us down. It's a mixture of two-year-old plants. So you will get flower next year, to be quite honest, as long as you get them into the ground now. Um, and um, probably... I don't know, 200 mil pot, eight inch pot um, would be the ideal scenario. Get hold of that Osma Coat uh, orchid potting mix. And with Cymbidiums, you want it to be the chunky one. So there's two versions of it. You want the chunky one for Cymbidiums. Um, great range of colors, greens, yellows, pinks, reds, and creams. So you could get all sorts of things. It's basically a mixture of, which is very, very cool. And that is a super price, um, two plants for $25. Remember, Garden Express delivered direct to your door. That's the great thing about Garden Express. You can shop online. You don't have to do anything. But one thing I will tell you about this deal is that uh, it won't last. That is, that's an exceptional price. And if you've ever thought about growing Cymbidium orchids, this is the time to do it because they will do exceptionally well. Okay, um, we're starting to run out of time. We're, um, we're getting uh, towards the end of the show. So make sure 
that you um, make sure that you do get your questions in. Make sure you tell us where you're from. Uh, that really important uh, that you do that. And uh, there's a few people who are saying, well, look, I'm from Melbourne. Well, look, believe it or not, if uh, you're, you're in Dandenong or if you're in uh, Monbulk or if you're in, uh, in the centre of the city, the conditions are actually quite different. So the advice might vary just a little bit. So you need to make sure that you are letting us know what suburb you're from. That's really important. Um, Linda wanted to ask or follow up on the advice on the yellow and gardenia. Can I use the Osmocote you have mentioned? It has iron and it has sulfate. You can, but the gardenia that you showed us um, with, a, with a, the discoloration in the foliage has actually got quite a significant problem. So I would suggest that you, you use the Osmocote, but you do supplement um, with iron sulfate. And uh, don't forget about the Epsom salts. It's the combination of the two that will really bring on a dark, lush green foliage on the plants. And the Osmocote will stimulate growth and flower production. That's why it's so important that you use them all. Iron sulfate, um, Epsom salts, which is magnesium sulfate, um, mix the Epsom salts up in a watering can. The iron sulfate is a granular you put in around the ground. Water the, the Epsom salts over the foliage. Wash the iron sulfate into the soil. Really important that you make sure that you make it soluble and your plants will love you for it, Linda. It will make a big difference to the health of the plant. Okay, Matthew, staying. Uh, let's, let's go to Melbourne. Yeah, Matthew. Um, what's the minimum amount of sunlight needed by hakeas? Well, it depends on the variety, Matthew. There are some hakeas that are very happy living under the canopy of other trees. Um, generally, uh, they would be quite sparse trees, so you're still getting good filtered light coming through. Um, but generally, most hakeas prefer 100% full sun. So I would suggest to you that that would be my preference that if you don't quite have the right environment, you're best not to try growing them because what will happen is they'll end up growing lanky if they do grow and they'll look, um, they, they won't look as good as they should do. It's probably the best way to put it. I hope that helps. Uh, Patrice, we're not sure where you're from, Patrice. After a few attempts, I started to successfully grow my first cucumbers. Well done. Lots of vines are coming through, but some of the leaves are dying off. Is this normal? This is a good example of we're talking thrips at the beginning of the show. Um, cucumbers are really susceptible to thrips and you'll see the leaves, uh, they kind of get these big dead patches on them and they turn yellow and that is classic thrip damage. You don't want it to stay on your cucumbers, you do need to treat it. Um, I was going to suggest, and we didn't talk about an actual chemical for chili thrip, uh, but western flower thrip, chili thrip, um, most of those thrips, they are treatable by applying something called Bathroid Advanced. Okay, it's better cyfluthrin. It's a very, very good active ingredient and it has been registered for the purpose of treatment of thrips. And it is something you can get from your local Bunnings store or you can order it online. But um, Bathroid Advance is what you find it under and that will knock those thrips for six. Make sure you read the instructions, Patrice, just to make sure that you are sprung with enough lead time so that you uh, do not have any residu residue left on the, the plants uh, when you actually start harvesting fruit. Really important. So read the instructions is the key message there, folks. Jill is in Bunbury. Bunbury is in the southwest of WA, a couple of hours south of Perth. Is there a natural way to keep spiders off outdoor furniture? Wow, that's a good question, Jill. Um, not that I can think of, no. Uh, the only way is manual, I think. Uh, sorry about that, but I'm not really sure of something else that would keep spiders off outdoor furniture. Uh, the only thing is going to be one of those residual insecticides if you want to make sure that they stay off. Um, but but that's, of course, uh, not a natural way to do it. Sorry. Sarja is in Campbelltown in New South Wales. Hello. I've noticed an influx of slugs. How do I deal with them? Well, it's been a really wet period of time, and this is the perfect conditions for slugs to actually uh, to really do a fair bit of um, damage. And I have got... Uh, the ultimate treatment for you, and that is a um, to use a copper-based spray. So you can actually get bluestone, right? So it comes in a container. I think I've got one sitting around here somewhere. I can't see it. But anyway, you can buy it, uh, and uh, you can apply that around the outside. Uh, slugs are mollusks, and mollusks have no tolerance of copper. So that would be a really good way um, to, to actually get control of them. Um, 
in a nice natural way. So um, what you do is create barriers and you can spread it around the outside. You don't want to put too much down, but sometimes just putting little trails. If it's in pots, you can get copper bands to go around the outside. These are all effective ways to control slugs and snails. Megan is in Woodgate in Queensland. What is the best natural treatment for mealybugs on cacti and succulents? Will diluted vinegar kill them? Um, look, diluted vinegar is probably not the ideal scenario. I think it's going to burn holes in your cacti and succulents for a start. Um, and that is a really difficult way, uh, a pest to control in cacti and succulents. I personally, if it was me and I, I just didn't want to use a chemical, I would take the plants out and I would wash the soil off and I'd wash the, the mealybugs off those roots and I would get the hose in and, and wash them out of the crevices of the, of the leaf. Um, but that's probably not something you're going to want to do and they are prickly and spiny. Um, best natural control, there is a, there is a treatment um, called bug killer from rich grow you'll find it probably in mitre 10 stores i would think uh, maybe do a google for it bug killer um it is a um it's a systemic insecticide and you would shake the granules in around the base of the plant around the top of the soil wash it in and it's drawn up through the roots and it'll kill all the mealybug i'm sorry it's not a natural treatment but mealybug is a nightmare and if you do not get on top of it it can be the end of your favourite plants, let me tell you, and particularly difficult to control on cacti and succulents. Leone is in Adelaide. I have a whitish substance coating the leaves of my potted roses. What could it be? Well, I'll guarantee you, because this is what I was expecting we would get today, and that is a lot of fungal disease problems. It'll be powdery mildew, Leone. It's a common pest at the moment um, of uh, cucubits, um, of most of the melons, the pumpkins, and of roses what you need to try and do is keep your roses dry at night that's the first thing you can use whole milk and spray it over the over the foliage um it's not, not going to solve the whitish problem because the whole milk of course is is white but it will kill off the fungus the most common treatments are to use fungicides and i would head into my local garden center if i was you i would grab some and i would give your plant a spray over the foliage otherwise you're going to find the leaves will turn yellow and the plant will drop its leaves, um, fairly natural um, response. But it's a, it really is a reflection at the moment of the hot, humid, um, wet conditions that we're experiencing right across the country. Okay, uh, let's keep, keep one more question. Okay, let's have a look at this. Gabby is in Collie in WA. It's a beautiful place uh, in the southwest of WA. It's, uh, it's, a, it's been... Um, I suppose one of those places that's not as well known, um, but it has the most beautiful environment around the outside uh, and a great place to explore if you're over here in the West. Now, what Gabby would like to know, and it's a cooler climate down there, um, is it too cold for frangipanis and mangoes? Now, I, I would think that you're probably borderline with mangoes. I think frangipani would probably struggle too. Um, in saying that, if you have a north-facing wall and you're planting a couple of metres off that wall and you are completely exposed to direct sunlight and you put your, your frangipani and your mangoes in now, you get them growing really well, so you're going to need to make sure that you've got good water on them, uh, nice organic soil and um, I would say regular feeding so that you get lots of growth and lots of root growth you may well be able to get them through the first winter. And if you can get them through the first winter, then the second winter, they will acclimatise, they will adapt. And that's the great thing about plants. So you may or may not get the best flowering. You may or may not get the best crops of mangoes. You're right on the borderline, Gabby. It'd be very difficult to say. It's going to be a bit of trial and error. I hope that helps you. Well, I can't believe it, but we have just about hit that time today. I want to let you know that there's, there's a lot of questions that have been coming through and we have decided that this coming Saturday, that's the 4th of December, at 9am Western Standard Time, that's 12pm Australian Eastern Daylight Time, we're going to do a just straight out questions and answer session for you. So uh, there'll be no special guests, there'll be no other interference, it'll just be you and I and I will answer your questions and help you keep your garden looking great. There are a lot of challenges out there and uh, and we're here to help. That's what we do. Lachlan's going to send some 
some messages out to the people who won those beautiful Mr. Fothergill's packet seeds. Um, you'll get notified straight after the show today. The Garden Gurus is still playing on Channel 9. We have a few more, I think it's three more weeks left of this season, and then we will rest over the summer. Make sure you check your local TV guide. I think it is 4.30 p.m. nationally, but check your local guide uh, because um, this is your chance to see the last episodes as we move into what will be a bit of a rest period over Christmas. Remember, you can always jump onto our website if you want to get some good information. It is a wonderful resource. And the other thing is our YouTube channel. If you want to watch programs, past, present, if you want to watch particular stories, our YouTube channel is a great way to go. And you can listen back to today's live stream as well simply by going to Spotify, Apple Podcast, and Audible. The good news is I'm going to see you on Saturday and I'll be back next Monday as well for the Garden Gurus Live. Um, Sorry? Oh, we've got Joe next week. Oh, well, I'm not going to see you on Monday. It's going to be Joe who will be joining us. So that'll be great. Okay, I'm just getting lucky, just giving me an update so I know what I'm doing. Um, look forward to seeing you uh, on Saturday. Happy gardening. Take care. See you. Bye-bye. This show is brought to you by The Garden Gurus and Evergreen Garden Care. Evergreen Garden Care and their market-leading brands are some of the most trusted consumer brands within the garden care market. They produce high-quality garden care products designed to help people create their own green oasis. Whether it's a garden, a balcony or potted indoor plants, they want to inspire anyone, anywhere to be able to easily create and maintain their own garden. To find out more about Evergreen Garden Care, head to www.lovethegarden.com. Garden Express are Australia's leading mail order gardening service, offering a wide range of quality garden products. Each week on the Garden Gurus Live, the team at Garden Express will share a weekly offer. So make sure after today's show, you jump online and visit their website.